Welcome everyone to the Valentine's Day edition of our Sunday morning Bible study, uh, February the 14th. The uh, topic is not Valentine's Day, but it's Matthew chapter seven, chapters 17 and 18, starting with chapter uh, 17, verse 24. We'll begin with a, a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, Lord God, bless us today as we study your word. And we see these events that uh, your son, our savior lived through in preparation for his, his uh, suffering and death and preparing also his disciples that they would be able to know the truth of your love and be able to share it with others. Bless us with this uh, faith in this message as well. In Jesus name, amen. All right, so last week we, we did begin with uh, the transfiguration account the history, which is today's gospel lesson, um, don't have to go into that detail, but remember that with, is the setting here. Jesus is being prepared uh, or preparing himself and preparing his disciples for his suffering and death. He's on his way to Jerusalem for the final time, but uh, have a few events still happening up in Galilee here in chapter 17. So we've got a coin in, the, in a fish's mouth is uh, one of the miracles uh, of Jesus. Maybe you're familiar, who's familiar with that miracle and who's never heard of it before? Familiar with it? Surprised by it. Okay, that, that's all right. Um, so always uh, neat things to, to understand and, and come to know when we hear scripture. Uh, let's go ahead and have, is there a volunteer to read uh, the, this whole, let's take uh, each paragraph as a separate thing so that, Three different people can raise your hands, uh, and I'll call on you if you are interested in reading. Yes, please. Take the first paragraph. First, uh, first paragraph. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax asked Jesus, "Said, doesn't your teacher pay temple tax?" He said, "Yes." Kurt, can you continue? Next paragraph. When he came into the house, Jesus spoke first. What do you think, Simon? Who in the caves of the earth collect gold and tax from their own son or from others? Okay. Someone else care to read here? Yeah, please. Jesus said to him, from others. Jesus said to him, from the others, from the sons are in him. And so what? So that, and so that we do not offend him, those who have seen, that's the book. And take the first fish that you pull up. Okay, so this miracle of re regarding the temple tax. Uh, first of all, a little bit of background on those notes on the right column. Uh, that temple tax was something that every Israelite who was over 20 years old had to pay annually as a maintenance cost of the temple. Uh, not something commanded in the Old Testament, but a, a practice, a custom put into place that uh, that the, the Jewish people wanted to participate in and agreed to participate in uh, for that maintenance of, of that house of God. Uh, regularly, it was due in March. So it seems like this time of year, uh, approaching that, that Passover, of when, you know, the Passover celebration, which was uh, the first full moon in spring, um, it seems that we are getting very close to that. And, and probably it, it's a possibility that this was a, a tax that was kind of past due, all right? Uh, and so the, the people asked, the, does your teacher pay the temple tax, right? Um, I mean, we might, uh, we're not sure if Peter's answer is presumptuous. So yes, yes, right? Because I don't know if Jesus ever, we don't have a record of Jesus ever having that conversation with Peter. Yes, we're gonna pay the temple tax. Maybe Peter knew from the past years that Jesus had always paid it, and he just assumed that he would continue to do it. Um, some have made a big deal about how Jesus spoke first when Peter came into the house, that this is a reprimand that Peter shouldn't have spoken quite yet. Um, I wouldn't quite say that, and we don't have a whole lot of evidence to show. There's, there's other examples of Peter speaking without thinking. Uh, this one, very likely Peter did, did think and respond based on uh, Jesus' previous paying of the tax. But Jesus does 
No, that's, I think, why Jesus spoke first. We have his omniscience, right? Jesus knows all things. That becomes clear with, with his comment. And, and it's a teaching moment, right? Uh, king's sons don't pay taxes, right? The king, does he have his son pay the tax? No, the king's son collects the tax for the king. And so what's the, what's the uh, application point? Does Jesus need to pay the tax? No, he's above the tax because he is true God. And so that uh, is definitely the, the, the truth that he takes home. But Jesus paid the tax uh, anyway. Why? Why did Jesus still pay the tax? Set an example. And then also to remove offenses. Yeah, in a sermon this morning, we talk about clouds bear, uh, barring people's view of the glory. And if someone had seen Jesus and known what his teaching was, but then at the very beginning, the first thing they know about Jesus is that he doesn't pay the temple tax. I mean, they will be offended and not listen to anything else he says. So even Jesus had that that point and that knowledge of when to remove the barriers to the gospel even in, it's kind of like a previous sermons we talked about that that yielding our christian freedom jesus was free he didn't have to pay it but for the good of the other people set an example and to not give offense he, he did pay it good example for us to follow um but follows up that point that he does pay the tax, but how he does it is miraculous. Any of you ever catch a fish that had something in its mouth? Anybody want to tell me something you uh, something that was in a fish's mouth? Other than a hook. The hook. That's not what I meant. Good, good answer, a hook. Anybody catch, yeah, so sometimes the, the bottom feeders, maybe there's a catfish that... <laughs> Yeah, and there'll be another fish in their mouth, something, something like that, yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that possibility. Sometimes there's actual items, you know, that, that, that fish might have swallowed, like Jonah, right? Um, no, but uh, in this situation, uh, it, it's possible that a bottom feeder or even a, a fish would find something on the bottom of the sea and, and uh, eat it. And um, maybe there's possibilities that uh, a coin could actually be in the fish's mouth. Um, even, it, it, but it wasn't just a coincidence, right? You tell someone, go catch a fish and there'll be a coin in the mouth. It, it, either Jesus controlled the whole situation to make it happen, or Jesus in his omniscience knew what was going to happen, right? This is, this is not a natural e event. Um, he had some amazing knowledge. Uh, but the point of that is, even though he was putting himself under the collectors of the temple tax, he showed himself above the tax, right? As the, the almighty ruler by, by that miracle. So any questions or comments on, uh, on, on this miracle, this coin in the fish's mouth, please. It definitely is an unusual But we know that it, it is a miracle, but it's very different. Yes, and right, it is, it is a miracle, not, not an act of trickery. Um, and, and if you think about the different miracles there are, there's, we say there's really four different purposes behind Jesus' miracles. Um, he fulfilled prophecy. He showed his divine power. Third one blanks one. The, the one of them is to show compassion. What's the fourth one? It, we, we kind of summarized uh, to show to fulfill prophecy, to show his power as the Almighty God, and to show compassion. And that the other one will come to me ten minutes from now, so I'll share with you. But but each miracle, Jesus didn't do all the same miracles all the time, right? He did different miracles, some rather unique. Well, a faith. To grow faith, okay, to create or strengthen faith. Okay, so let's go through them again. So the, what purposes did Jesus have with miracles? Fulfill prophecy, to show his divine power, to create or strengthen faith, or to show his compassion. Which one would this be? 
I think mostly here we see his, his uh, divine power, right? His divine power is shown here, but then also in some way to strengthen that faith of the disciples uh, as, as they were, okay, this is another miraculous event that, that he did. Any other comments or questions on that? When you, when you study a bunch of the miracles, they can, they can all seem to have the same purpose. But once you divide it out, okay, how is this particular miracle, this healing of the blind man, different from the other healing of the blind man? And uh, it can, or it, it can be some, some teaching moments in, or, or learning moments for you as you study that. All right. So um, we have Second Peter chapter 1. Um, that just reminds us of Peter's summary of that transfiguration from today's gospel lesson, uh, that message from God. And I'm going to try it when I talked about last week, right? That deep voice. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Uh, obviously, I would say God's voice was a lot different than mine, uh, that, that authority that he spoke with. All right, moving on to chapter 17. I'm uh, sorry, chapter 18 on from chapter 17. And uh, who is the greatest is, is a question. And as we read this, kind of those notes on the right column, I want you to consider as this as we go through this, how the events recorded in the previous section led into the question, bad typo there. How did the events recorded in the previous section or the previous chapter lead into the question, who is the greatest? Um, Carol, are you up to reading that first paragraph of chapter 18? Sure. At that time, the disciples approached Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child, had him stand in the middle of them, and said, Amen, I tell you. Unless you are turned and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives a little child like this one in my name receives me. Someone care to take the next paragraph? Uh, yes, please, Carol. The other Carol. Were you reading off the sheet or was that the NIV version? Okay, all right. I thought there was one word different, but it, it might have been just my hearing. And since uh, we're, we have another Carol, uh, Carol, other Carol, would you read? And we'll have a trifecta of Carols reading this section. Uh, verse 8, that paragraph. If your hand or your foot cut it off and throw it away, it is better for you to strike just as a rain than to stand and take the same fire with the same thing. If your eye finds it, pluck it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to be joined in hellfire with two eyes. See to it that you do not look down on one who is worth a while, because I tell you that there are people in heaven always who have waited for my father. Thank you. So let's take this uh, this teaching moment uh, apart. Uh, that question I had at the beginning: What previous or earlier events would have led up to this question? Who's the greatest? Yeah, the disciples were arguing among themselves as well about this, and probably uh, from the um, from the other gospel writers, they were arguing, you know, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. And then let's go ask Jesus, what does he say? Um, so that one's not, not recorded here for us, but what, what events from chapter 17 might have led them to start to argue? Who went up on the mountain of transfiguration? Three of 12, right? And Jesus, you know, in part had said, don't tell anyone that part of uh, that, that whole plan was, uh, all right, you don't understand, and probably we're going to avoid this elitism 
right? The, are the, and, and maybe these other nine. Jesus, do you have favorite disciples? Right? And Peter is a sp spokesman for the group. Peter got to go pick the fish out of the sea and then pull the coin out of the mouth and pay the tax. Maybe Peter's the favorite. You know, and so, huh. and they all wanted Jesus. Oh, no, I want to be your favorite, Jesus, right? Which of you is Jesus' favorite? Which one? <laughs> he loves you all the same. Your parents know that with your, when you have more than one kid. Um, and even as a, as a human being, we don't do that perfectly, but uh, our Lord Jesus loves all of his children the same. Um, and so uh, we see who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How does Jesus answer? Uh, the little child, right? Turn and become like children. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. How does a child illustrate greatness in God's kingdom? The John first. Um, by showing uh, humility and submission to authority. Humility, submission to authority. Yes. Accepting childlike faith. Childlike faith. And. Yeah. So, yeah. And what is that? Right. Accepting the faith is just agreeing. Yeah, that's what uh, that's the way it is, Dad. Right. You, you said the stars are hung by strings. Right. You said there's a blanket in the sky with with holes punched in. And that's where the stars come from. So you believe it. So, uh, so when you have that childlike faith, you got to put it in someone who's going to tell the truth, which is why it's a wonderful thing that we've got. Please. Yeah. Trusting. Uh, yeah, the, and, and part of that trusting is, is that humility that recognizes, right, I can't even make my own peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? So faith says, mom, make me the sandwich. All right, dad, make me the sandwich. And, and we as a human being, uh, what, how, do, how do we get greatness in the kingdom of God? By receiving the gifts Jesus gives of forgiveness. And what is a childlike faith to say? Oh, I can't even make a peanut butter sandwich of forgiveness, right? I need God to give me all of the forgiveness. And so that's the humility aspect, right? Um, a commentator I read said, humility is the basic Christian virtue. And the next sentence on my notes kind of explain, because there's no virtue in God's sight without humility. Right? If you're talented at speaking or talented at, uh, at, at displays of love, or you're talented at whatever else it is, and it's a very virtuous thing, but you think, I'm so great because of this virtue. You've lost the virtue in God's sight. John, go ahead. That's great, great mention. Uh, and I, I just uh, thought of this, but if, if humility, if you're correct, that humility is the greatest virtue, which I don't disagree with. Pride, human pride is the greatest. Um, great, the opposite of that, pride is the greatest trap that people fall into, that we all fall into, is pride. Yeah, and yeah, that, 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 that opposite uh, does play out. And, and hold that thought because some of the, I don't want to get too much deeper into it yet because this whole section plays together. Um, but yes, pride is in two, please. Yeah, and you're right. That, uh, I, I don't know any children who, who are always humble, right? The, the kids always want to be the best at something or other. And, and, and uh, very quickly, that trusting in, in dad can become pride to show off to dad, right? Look how I can do this by myself, how I can walk on the ice by myself. Don't hold my hand, dad, right? Okay, dad, hold my hand. Right? So that, that, that hopefully we learn from, from that example as well. Good point about, about children. Um, neat thing in verse uh, verse three, unless you are turned, I, I didn't look at the Greek until just now because it didn't stand out until it was being read, but uh, are turned is you oftentimes that word for, uh, it includes that word for repentance, um, but okay. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the repentance word. In, in the Greek, uh, the, the changing of the, of the, the turning of the mind, but um, being turned, it definitely is, is that picture of 
turned away from our human our pride and becoming like a child in our, in our faith. So that is that basic need of trusting in God to be in his kingdom. Uh, genuine humility then, verse 5, it reveals itself in how we treat kids. Whoever receives a little child like this one in, in my name in, uh, receives me. Right? When we have a childlike faith, it will show itself in how we receive others. Comments, questions on that paragraph? Yes, yeah, Sue, please. Yeah, good point there. And I was going to, I got distracted by looking up the Greek. Um, but exactly, whenever you have that word for uh, repentance, it is always in the passive voice. And it's very striking that it is in the passive voice here that you are turned. Again, this is the work of God, the Holy Spirit, that the bringing you to faith. That yeah, that is a, a very good good point to bring, John. And that, that turning, I heard this on a, another commentator. The turning it is uh, has two, two the turning away from sin and the turning towards God. Yeah, there's that positive aspect uh, of turning towards God, and that also involves the turning away from, the negative aspect away from sin. So in verse 6, as we move on, these little ones, um, I oftentimes use this verse to indicate little ones who believe in me. And there I did look up the Greek word. The Greek word for little ones um, is actually the word mikron. You know what a microscope is? right? The, the smallest. So there's actually words for uh, infants, micron, that's different from brephos, which is uh, the toddlers and then other children as well have different age groups would have different names to describe them. This is the smallest of the small, the, the little ones who believe in me. Um, and uh, if you cause them to sin, how do you cause a, a little one to sin? By a bad example, right? instruction in sin showing them how to or even i, I think of this here and it, and the uh, the need for parents to bring children to be baptized right with well, that that's really uh cutting them off from god for you to not bring a young child to be baptized Carol. Yeah, they're baptized yeah, that baptism, then you have a follow-up uh, definitely needed as well. Yeah. Well, just in a very general sense, uh, it could be a grown-up acts of commission or acts of omission. Yep, exactly. Yes, that, that acts of omission or sins of omission or commission, uh, all of and any of those could be what causes them, them to sin. Um, and what's this about the huge millstone? Right? So violent. There are violent verses in, in the scripture and, and a huge millstone hung around their neck and thrown in the depths of the sea. Um, what's he saying? Basically, a violent bodily death would be better than bearing the guilt for destroying a child's faith. Not telling anybody that the, the point is not go out and, and plan to do that with a millstone. Uh, the point is prevention. Think of how serious a thing it is. You would do everything you could if you, uh, if you went out on a boat with a millstone in the boat. I don't think you would do anything that would allow a rope to go around the millstone and then also around your neck. I don't think any of you would do that. You'd prevent that. Jesus is saying, do whatever you can to prevent uh, a little child who believes in me from, uh, from falling away. And so what's, you do the positive. You instruct them in, in, in that faith. Um, you do all you can. Um, woe to the world because of temptations to sin. Temptations must come. Striking thought. Why must temptations come in this world? God uses them to make us stronger. Um, and if the, you were going to say, sin, it's a sinful world. Uh, you remember Adam and Eve, <laughs> right? Temptations come into the world on all of us after, after the fall into sin. Um, but woe to the person through whom the temptation comes. Again, repeating that prevention um, that we 
don't, we don't want to be the instruments of temptation. We want to be the positive instruments as well. Uh, questions on that paragraph, additional comments? Sue. Good question. She asked that and uh, made my comment that little ones, microns, uh, uh, I mentioned is referring to babies. Um, she asked, could it be someone who is weak in the faith or just beginning to believe? In this instance, I think it's really a child, a baby. There are other places where Jesus says something similar, parallel passages, and I don't have them before me, where it really isn't, doesn't seem to be the context talking about children but someone new to the faith. So that terminology could be used as someone weak in the faith. I think here the context says we're talking about children. But very good question. So verses uh, eight and following. Um, yeah, hand or foot caused you to sin, your eye caused you to sin. You, you get the point in the picture. Uh, better to go to heaven lame than to go to hell with your body intact. First of all, does one of your body parts cause you to sin? Is it your eye that causes you to sin? Your hand causes you to sin? Your foot? No. Right. The temptation comes from the, the heart, the human heart. Um, I, you know, I say in an application of this verse, you want to remove all temptations, you've got to remove the beating heart from your body. And, and you're not going to do that without committing a very grievous sin, right? No, you, that, so again, Watch how you use your body is, is the point. Don't, don't give in. You're, you're going to watch out for these temptations and don't then become part in the sharing of them and do what you can to, to prevent the temptations from coming. You know, rather than gouging out my eye, um, maybe I'll unplug the TV, right? Maybe, maybe I'll have certain uh, things installed on my computer to prevent certain things from popping up. Um, there are other things to do other than cutting off the body, um, but yeah, might might seem a little easier to uh, pluck out an eye than uh, than uh, remove some of the temptations from coming. So again, the point is, watch how you use your body. You don't want it to lead you into sin. Um, so we have that personal application. Remember, we're talking about caring for others with those little children. That personal application of preventing temptation from yourself, and then going back to looking at others. Look at verse 10. See to it you do not look down on one of these little ones. Right? And what's another reason? Not just because of the commission God's given us not to bring them to sin, but to bring them up in the faith. We got partners working with us. Who are the partners? Angels. And this is one of the passages that you might, that uh, some people might say, oh, look, this is proof. There's a guardian angel for, for each child. We don't have to go to something like that, but God does give his angels that job of caring for little ones as well. Maybe in a special way, and think of uh, some of the falls that, uh, that kids can have, even my personal experience. And oh, yeah, thankful an angel was watching over them, or they almost fell. Uh, you know, and that didn't, or the parent was able to catch them. Be, well, an angel helped me be there for that. Um, yeah, we have, we have partners in that care. Uh, and those angels, not only are caring for the kids, they, they, they actually see the, our Heavenly Father. Um, verse 11. Anybody have your NIV Bible open? Kurt, you have the NIV Bible? Yeah. Would you read chapter 18, verse 11 in the NIV? Verse 11. Keep looking. There's no verse 11. Thank you. There is no verse 11 in the NIV. You'd have to look in the footnotes. All right. Uh, this is uh, current. Thanks for being a good sport with that. Um, so it, this is a, one of the examples of a variant. Okay. The, the editors of the NIV Bible said, oh, the support for including this verse here um, is, is not as widespread as necessary to include it in, in the text. Now, it's definitely a scriptural truth. The Son of Man came to save what was lost. 
Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Uh, you don't have to look it up, but you can if you want, because that word is there and there's not a textual variant. But it's in the same subject matter, it seems like the scribes might have, for some reason, added a sentence. That's what the NIV commentator said. The EHV included it because this is a questionable one because it is widespread and there are ancient texts on both sides. Um, and, and anybody who wants to look at what that list of texts is, I do have my Greek Bible that has the list and, and all various papyrus and, and uh, translations from, from Augustine and different people that do include it or don't. Um, I, just a quick glance at it, I couldn't really, I couldn't come to a quick answer. Uh, so it said, so, all right. Don't get in the fret or fear about the Bible being untrustworthy because of the variants, because this is found elsewhere and it is scriptural. No place in the Bible that has a variant ever has uh, something that uh, would remove our faith or change uh, our faith. Uh, so, so anyway, I do like that it's included here. Um, it, that in the EHV had, but again, even if you have that EHV Bible in front of you, it does have the footnote, right? It says some manuscripts omit this verse. If you can read that small print, if you have that Bible. Any question about uh, about that here, John? Well, this is kind of a basic English question. Uh, verse back about 11, verse 11. Um, is there a topic, would you say, do you think there's a topic what we call a topic or a thesis uh, statement or sentence in chapter 18 that would justify including verse 11. Well, it's easy to relate things to each other, but do you see it directly relating to the thesis statement if there is one in chapter 18? Um, the, yeah, the whole point of faith and the children coming to faith and removing temptation and then us doing our part to share the gospel with them so they hold to the faith and maintain the faith um, and, and avoiding the temptations. This verse gets us to the, what our faith is in, the basis of the faith, right? We put our faith in the Son of Man and his purpose for coming, saving. So yeah, so it does fit with the context. Uh, it's not, not thrown in out of the blue. Yeah, so. uh, it's because... Uh, the Son of God is not mentioned anywhere until verse 11. So, I mean, specifically mentioned other than the speaker, other than the teacher himself. So, you could look at it. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah, right. He, he is... Uh... He's giving us the purpose. And you go back to chapter 17 and, and this, he talks about the son of man coming and, and, and I'm going to die. And so we do recently have that reference to the son of man, his purpose for coming uh, there. on. Uh, so I think, good to repeat it. So it's yeah, good to bring it up again. It is good, yeah, good to repeat it. Any other questions or comments on this section about uh, the greatness and the kingdom of God, the faith of little children? Uh, Carol, please. First paragraph, verse three, please. There's a much worse term. When I look at the NIV, it says in the 19 So it just, it, but I know it's not something that I would do. I'm not going to do it. This is something that uh, it just seems to be confusing to me. Or is it going to help me to see this thing? So I like the way it says in the Greek version, it uses such a much larger term, meaning something happened. And uh, yeah, so is it changed or turned? And, and the passive voice is there. And you ask that question. Let me look and see about, I'm get, it's, for those of you who know Greek, uh, the Greek word is uh, strafete. Strafete. S, uh, sigma. Anyway, I won't spell it for you. But uh, let me look it up in my dictionary here and we'll see if I can uh, draw. I'm going to have to do a little bit more uh, checking on this. Oh, dreadful. Okay, so turn around, turned into change, inwardly turn away. 
and, and it's a past, the error is passive, but it can mean all of those things, change inwardly, turn away uh, to give back. But again, it is the passive. So the NIV um, probably would have been better to be unless you are changed rather than saying unless you change. So yeah, improvement is the translation. Th thank you for that, for making me dig into, dig into it a little bit more, please. Anybody have the King James Version in front of them? I have to get back to you on that for next week. All right. Oh, uh, so I got someone in the chat box here. Oh, yes, like Saul to Paul. Uh, good, good comment there. Uh, that being changed, right? There wasn't anything that, the, that uh, Saul did to become Paul. All right, uh, we're going to move on here to verse 12 uh, of the lost sheep parable. And think about how this emphasizes the discussion about little children. A Ken or Harriet, you've been watching very patiently. Do either one of you care to read uh, this? Uh, uh, I guess it's 12 through 14. If you unmute. If you don't unmute in five seconds, I'm calling on somebody else. Was that five seconds? There we go. Oh, there we go. It worked. Okay, the lost sheep. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go looking for the one that wandered away? If he finds it, amen. I tell you, he rejoices more over that one sheep, more over that one sheep than over the 99 that did not wander away. In the same way, your father in heaven does not want even one of these little ones to perish. All right, so what do you think? Do you understand this parable? Anybody want to explain the answer to the question in my notes? How does this parable emphasize the value Jesus puts on a little child? He doesn't want them to wander. He wants them to be there with him too. Yeah, Jesus doesn't want, and, and you think of the comparison. You got a hundred sheep, what's one more? Ah, I can do with just 99. I'm not going to go through the effort of taking care of that one that wandered away. But Jesus is saying, no, you, have all, you want all 100 sheep. And same with the little children. You have all these people, and then there's a little child that's away. And God, God doesn't care about that one because it's not important. You no, know, God cares is the point. So the value Jesus does put is on a child is very high. John, comment? Yes, then if you put this uh, parable in historical context, um, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, a sheep, a, a one sheep would be a very valuable commodity uh, compared to sheep today. You know, we have millions and millions of sheep, you know, from uh, race today in the United States and whatever. So back, back then, it seems to me that a sheep would be very, very extremely high value, even one sheep, even one sheep yeah. would have extremely high value in the next time. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and, yeah, thinking about the value. You got a stack of a hundred single, hundred dollar bills, hundred one dollar bills, and you lose one. And you count, oh, there's only 99. Some folks would tell us, it's only a dollar bill. Wind blew away, I don't worry about it. You got to, wouldn't you go look for it? Yeah, go try to find that. Turn the house upside down until you find that one dollar. Because that's the value that God places, uh, places on. And again, turning that and bringing it to the value God places on individuals. Uh, questions or comments on that parable? I think it, uh, in a lot of ways, a very applicable way of explaining itself. But it also applies to what follows. What's the next section? Show your brother his sin. So think about a sheep that's wandered away. That's what this, uh, this situation uh, goes into. Someone care to read a volunteer to read this paragraph? It's a little bit longer. Verses 15 to 20. Please. Your brother is in the you Go and show him your sin. This is doing good. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. And if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. He 
Amen, I tell you. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen, I tell you again. The two of you on earth agree to ask for anything. I will be done for them by my Father. It will be done with, for them by my Father. It is in heaven. In fact, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I will be among all right, thank you for reading that longer section. So looking at this, would you see how it relates to the paragraph before? God has a methodology of regaining the lost sheep. It's you, you know, sharing sharing the message and calling the, them to repent if a if, uh, brother or sister in the faith has wandered. Um, so what's the situation? The brother, uh, show your brother his sin. Oh, a Christian sinning with no desire to forsake the sin make amends for it. We do recognize we sin every day uh, and we, we, we repent every day in and of ourselves, uh, personally to God. And we publicly do it when we gather for worship as a group. We privately do it if there's something heavy on our heart that we did wrong. We call the pastor or, or visit with the pastor in person and say, I did this wrong. And, and the pastor can say, your sins are forgiven, right? And so that is this regular situation of confession and receiving forgiveness. Here, someone has done committed a sin and they say it wasn't wrong. Or I, I know it was wrong, but I don't care. I'm not going to stop doing it. Then, and even if it's, and it says if they sin against you, if they've done that, they've, they repeatedly come and, and, uh, and punch you in the face and give you a black eye every morning, right? That neighbor comes over and gives you a black eye every morning. Well, he's a member of your church. You can have a conversation. Please don't do that for Jesus' sake. All right? Just, you know, it's a pretty ridiculous situation because we wouldn't expect a Christian to do that. But he says, no, I'm going to keep on doing it. Nothing wrong with it. Or if there's something wrong with it, I don't care. All right? Have a conversation with him. Right? So that's pretty obvious if they've sinned against you. But what if they've sinned against nobody else? They're not sinning against you. They're just living in a way that doesn't go according to God's will. And they say, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't care. It's not hurting anybody. I'm just, oh, my, my highest priority is getting rich. So money is more important to me than God. Right? And they're making it obvious that way. And they're telling it publicly that's the way they're living. Money is more important to me than God. What's my duty? Is that sinning against me? Well, in a way, it is, because you, you have concern for searching out the lost sheep. And if somebody else is living in a sin that is separating them from God, what else have they done? They have separated themselves from fellowship with the other believers. Your relationship with them is affected if they continue living in a sin, even if it is not personally against so that situation does apply here. Most importantly, what's the first step? Tell everybody at this table what they did to me. I'm going to go to the individual, talk to them one on one. Right? Please. Do you have a right to judge? And you won the cast stone. Excellent question. Right? Jesus talked about that with the woman who was caught in adultery. I let him who has no sin cast the first stone. I don't think you're casting a stone if you are going to someone who is obviously living in a sin, obviously committing a sin and say, there's nothing wrong with it. Or if there's something wrong with it, I don't care. You're not throwing a stone to say, your living is inconsistent with the Christian faith. That's not throwing a stone. That's not condemning. That is calling them to repentance, which is different from the punishment of throwing a stone. That was, um, we, have, we are called on to judge people. And even though inside, sometimes we have, uh, right, we're told not to judge. Don't judge in a judgmental way, right? But I am called on to show my brother his sin, which means I must judge his actions by their appearances and say, is it lining up with God's word or is it not? And it's tricky to judge without being judgmental. It takes practice and it takes that loving heart, which what's the goal? 
not to show him better, yeah, to bring him back with that. And uh, one year brother over is the NIV, and I forget how it was translated here. It's a little different. Um, restored him, is that what it says? It, you regained your brother. You have regained your brother. So that's a positive thing. That's the goal. I'm not sharing it to be judgmental or seem better. I want to regain him for the him or her for the Christian faith. So the attitude, the purpose. Please. This is something I've heard The way, okay, does a Christian have business judging an unbeliever? Shouldn't a Christian just judge another Christian? I would not say it that way. There may be some aspects of that that I could say, I think I know where they're coming from. But the way I interact with a fellow Christian is going to be different from the way I interact with an unbeliever, right? Um, I will use God's law for both. Uh, probably, I, I have more of a basis of starting point with a Christian to come and correct. Um, I, I guess with an unbeliever, I would probably have to strive very hard not to be judgmental. And for an unbeliever, I would just say, this is what God's word says, right? And not, and not even, you can't come from the starting point. Well, you know what this says, and, and uh, you're going to agree with this. Open up God's word. This is what it says. And I'm just sharing this message with you. And if they walk away from the conversation, that's the end with an unbeliever, right? If they walk away and leave that conversation, I can't go and it's not my job to chase them down and make sure they listen and no, it doesn't do any good once they've walked away. With a fellow Christian who claims to believe the same thing, and if they start to walk away, then it's my duty to go and take it a step further and take some others with me because he's not trusting me, not responding well to me, think, thinking it's a, it's a personal matter, right? Then I take two or three others. That's just the next step. Right? I don't, don't just stop like I might with an unbeliever. Uh, fellow Christian, I'll take it to this next step. Two or three others. Why? But you want to choose someone who's spiritually mature, who would have an understanding, a willingness to go out and search for the lost sheep. It's not an easy task to confront with love. Right? So, so it, you think of the leadership in, in, the, in the congregation, perhaps. Maybe if it's you, you go and tell them one, maybe the next one uh, that you'll bring is the pastor. Pastor, help me with this because I'm not getting anywhere with identifying this sin. And what are they to do? It's the matter established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Doesn't have to be a witness of the sin, but they're actually witnesses of the lack of repentance, which is another sin, right? You have the sin and then the lack of repentance is an ongoing sin. Um, they would be witness, you know, witnesses of that lack of repentance. Um, it's, again, showing the seriousness of it, uh, that millstone concept. You realize by living this way, it's worse than having a millstone tied around your neck and falling in the sea. So that, that's part of that, that uh, thing that's underlined. Um, so, so answer that question. Any other comments on, on that? So, Sue, please. Yeah, there are other reasons for the repentance. The point that's brought up here is, uh, is bringing them to repent to regain them for their own benefit for the church. There are additional reasons why we practice that correction, that Christian discipline. Um, we have that example to others, right? Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, we didn't study it recently, but uh, one of the issues in that congregation was uh, incest, an incestual relationship within the church. And the church was bragging, we can do this because we're Christians. The Apostle Paul says, not even the unbelievers think this is okay. What a bad example. 
one another reason to correct, right? Um, in in the book of Revelation, the the one congregation, uh, I can't think which one it is, but the, but um, they were tolerant. I think it was Laodicea. They were tolerating the sin of sexual immorality and not throwing somebody out. And so in that congregation, the people who were tolerating it were condemned as well, and in effect supporting that sin by not correcting. Uh, so yeah, there are other reasons, but the main one that Jesus underlines here, it's always the first one, is to regain the brother or sister. And, and, but yeah, actually in this section, now that I think about it, it is connected to not causing somebody else to sin. Because if I don't correct his way of living and a young child sees that way of living and thinks, oh, he can still be in the church, even though his job is a bank robber, I'm going to grow up to be a bank robber, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to be part of that cause of somebody else to sin, uh, a little one. So, yeah, the weak in the faith as your Paul. Part of our Yeah, so thank you for that. Just to, just to summarize it again, I'm thinking about society. Society wants us to be quiet on this and wants the Christian voice not to speak about identifying sin. But we are called on to do it, not in a judgmental way, but to do it uh, to win them over for goal of salvation. Question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there. All right. That that is coming at us in society that uh, we that uh, we people want Christianity to be silent because we proclaim God's law and we do not tolerate violations of God's law. Law. We identify them. We don't have the sword to enforce it. Right. If our government chooses not to enforce certain laws, you know, or certain commandments of God, right, doesn't mean that we stop proclaiming what those commandments are. All right, um, want to move on from this as we continue the, the section. We talk, I got those bullet points. Notice I didn't put them as number because if I numbered them, you might think, okay, did one move on to two? They're bullet points because I might go individually to someone repeatedly three, four, five, six, seven, eight times or more, right? To tell them individually, maybe I'm getting a little bit of hay weight, um, um, getting a little bit of a success. They're, they're making, making some, uh, they might be receptive. When they start to walk away and say, no, it's not gonna work. That's when I take someone out, right? With mature Christians to call the brother to repent, the witnesses are witnessing the lack of repentance. Then it says telling the church because it really indicates the seriousness of sin. And it gives everybody in that church the opportunity to be kind and loving and try to win them back. Again, it's not to smear the name. Okay, we love this individual and we want to bring them back. Each one of you. You've ever been in the congregation where that discussion was held. You don't bring it up one Sunday, excommunication, and they're done in the same meeting. Right? You tell it to the church so that everybody can call them back. Um, Excommunication is then really excommunicating for that lack of repentance. It means that they can't be regarded anymore as a Christian by their own actions, by their, their lack of repentance. Uh, and, and there may be a time when uh, a member of the congregation who is a Christian does walk away 
and actually short circuits the process by saying, okay, you're going to continue at this with me. And you just came at me with all your leadership. I'm leaving the church. You, you grant them a, a release um, that not in good terms, but you release them from membership um, because they've asked for that. You don't can't continue the process and excommunicate after they've already left. Uh, so there's different processes that, that happen here uh, as you walk through these steps. Again, what's the goal? To win, win the brother over. And what power do we have in this? That's what goes on with here when Jesus says the amen words in verse 18, right? Whatever you uh, bind on earth, we bound in heaven. This is the ministry of the keys. Binding is tying or locking, saying your sins are still with you. Loose is untying or unlock, unlocking heaven doors with, with forgiveness. Jesus, I gave this, I repeated this announcement of, of, uh, of the ability to forgive to uh, his disciples on Easter Sunday, right? If you forgive anyone his sins, uh, uh, they're forgiven. He gives, gives that blessing. Uh, and notice this verse 20 in the context here, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am among them. We've applied that verse oftentimes to worship, especially on a lower attendance in summer or Saturday afternoon when I've had two or three people in worship. And I remind them, hey, two or three are here, God's with us. It's a comfort to know that. But notice the point of application here. This is about forgiving. If two or three of you are together pronouncing a word of forgiveness for somebody, it's forgiven. So what, what a blessing that is that we see that, uh, that power revealed. Kind of went through that quickly. I'm going to stop right here, but uh, any questions you all have or applications you want to make online or in person uh, before we pause and can finish up the chapter next week? Please. Yeah, so yeah, again, if you didn't hear that online, this preparation for Lent is really wonderfully done here in, in this message, in these chapters. Um, that's why I think Matthew has it right before, uh, right before Jesus goes to Holy Week. Think about all these th truths about forgiveness, his purpose for coming, and, and also his power uh, and, and his servant-like attitude. Thank you. Just why don't we close with, with a word of prayer? Lord God, bless us through the study of your word. Give us hearts that are willing to forgive and willing to be examples of the faith so that others may be strengthened. Bless us in this calling of sharing your gospel by which we are saved. Amen.